Hello, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Ken Sasai, the president of Japan Institute of International Affairs. Welcome this uh, the sixth Japan India in the Pacific Forum or ninth uh, Japan India Truck 1.5 Dialogue. Uh, yesterday, we had a very good discussion in closed sessions and uh, based upon the regional and global development taking place. There is enormous changes now uh, taking place around the world. So um, we address all these issues and also we address the bilateral agenda, including trade, economic, defense, and security. So it was a lively discussion. So today uh, we'd like to uh, have a more open discussion with your own participation we welcome all of you coming to participate. Uh, first of all, uh, let me, uh, you know, introduce uh, my co-moderator, uh, the uh, Ambassador Hemant Shin, and Director General of DPG. Uh, Ambassador, please, you have remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Sasai. Uh, good morning, Ohio Guzaimas. Uh, I'm Hemant Singh. Uh, Director General of the Delhi Policy Group. Uh, it's my pleasure to join uh, you at this open session, Ken, uh, of our sixth Indo-Pacific Forum, ninth Track 1.5 Dialogue. Uh, we do uh, recognize that this is the premier forum for strategic communication uh, between India and Japan. And our intention is to foster even greater policy coordination and to accelerate uh, cooperative trends in diverse fields, uh, security, defense, economic security. We have discussed these issues yesterday at the closed sessions. We have also looked at certain distortions that are disturbing the international community and widening rifts. We've discussed remedies towards a more democratic world order in which dialogue and diplomacy are prioritized. And we have underlined the need for greater synergies to ensure that balance and stability is maintained uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I'd like to uh, just say that uh, we are poised at a difficult and important moment of history. And uh, India and Japan are tied together by bonds of geography, of history, of values, of convergences, and also of the potential to change the future of the Indo-Pacific. I'll stop there. Over to you, Ken. Well, thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, uh, let me uh, introduce uh, keynote uh, speakers. Uh, first of all, our uh, uh, Excellency, Ms. Kamikawa Yoko, Minister for F Foreign Affairs of Japan. Namaskar, konnichiwa. Gaimu daijin no Kamikawa Yoko desu. 第6回日印インド太平洋フォーラムの開催をお祝い申し上げます。インドの皆様は東京にようこそおいでくださいました。私は9月に外務大臣に就任いたしましたが、以前から日印友好議連に所属するなどインドとの関係を推進してまいりました
多くの挑戦に直面している中基本的価値と戦略的利益を有する特別戦略的グローバルパートナーである日円両国の連携はますます重要になっております。日印館では本年だけでも首脳会談を3回実施し二国間関係から地域国際情勢に至るまで幅広く議論を重ねてきました。私自身、大臣就任直後の9月の国連総会で、ジャイ・シャンカル外相と会談を実施し、地域や国際社会の諸課題への対応について、両国で一層連携していくことを確認しました。本年は、日本が G7、インドが G20 の議長国をそれぞれ務めております。来年もまた、日米豪インの外相会合を日本が首脳会合をインドがそれぞれホストする年であり引き続き両国が連携してインド太平洋そして国際社会を共にリードすることになりますそうした日印間の絆は両国政府の間でのみ深められるものではありません新しい時代において経済社会の幅広い分野で関係を強化していくことが重要です国民同士の対話も強めていく必要があります中でも日印間の知的対話の強化は両国のみならず世界全体にとっても大きな意義を有しており今回6回目となる日印インド太平洋フォーラムはそのために大きな貢献をしてこられました皆様のこれまでのご努力に心からの感謝と敬意の念を表したいと思います。今次会合におきましても、自由で開かれたインド太平洋の実現に向け、日印両国がどのように取り組んでいくべきか、本日、ご臨席の皆様の間で活発な議論が行われることを期待しております。ダンニョワード、ありがとうございました。Well,、uh, thank you,、uh, Minister Kamikawa,、uh, for、uh, expressing the great expectation for this、uh, 1.5 dialogue. Now, I, I'd like to、uh, introduce His Excellency Dr.、Uh, J. a y Shankar, Minister of External Affairs of India. Namaskar. Good morning. Ohayo gozaimasu. I'm very pleased to address the sixth India Japan Indo Pacific Forum today. Congratulations to the organizers, Delhi Policy Group, DPG, and the Japan Institute of International Affairs, JIIA, for bringing together a diverse set of thinkers to hold a purposeful dialogue on India Japan cooperation. A free, open, and inclusive Indo Pacific is at the core. Of our special strategic and global partnership. And conversely, the India Japan relationship has the ability to influence and shape the future of the Indo Pacific. This is a goal extremely important, not just to our two nations, but to others in the region and the world at large. A safe, secure, and stable maritime space in the region is a necessary. Condition for peace, security, and prosperity. Ensuring that means promoting human security in all its dimensions and countering attempts to disrupt commerce, disturb the ecology, or assert untenable ownership and rights. India's approach to the Indo Pacific has been shaped by our broadening horizons, deepening interests, and globalized activities. A strong partnership with Japan, built upon our shared democratic values and respect for rule of law, is the centerpiece of our vision. We see alignment between India's a c t i s policy, our Indo Pacific vision, and our Sagar outlook, and Japan's free and open Indo Pacific vision. Our endeavor to create an inclusive structure of maritime security in our region is exemplified. By the Indo Pacific Oceans Initiative, IPOI. 
Its seven pillars address different aspects of the challenges that the international community confronts. We are looking forward to concrete cooperation on maritime trade, transport and connectivity pillar of IPOI that Japan has agreed to co-lead. The India-Japan partnership has steadily broadened in recent years. It is reflected in arrangements such as the Quad, the Supply Chain Resilience Initiative, the Clean Energy Partnership and the Semiconductor Supply Chain Partnership. We have also joined multilateral initiatives like the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity, IPEF. These are critical in creating a reliable and resilient global economy. Japan continues to play an important role in India's economic growth story. It is actively involved in various national campaigns and flagship initiatives of India. Particularly noteworthy are the infrastructure development, ICT and digitization, energy, space, food processing, science and technology, healthcare and R&D cooperation. We are working on a shared commitment to realize the 5 trillion yen goal uh, of investment, which is approximately 42 billion US dollars over the next five years. Defense and security has also seen growth in recent years. There have been an increasing frequency of defense exchanges. In January this year, we achieved a new milestone through the Veer Guardian bilateral fighter aircraft exercise. We also see scope for increasing defense equipment and technology cooperation. 2023 has also been an important year for both our countries as chairs of two international groupings, the G20 and the G7. It was with a sense of exceptional responsibility that India took up the G20 presidency. Our vision for one earth, one family, one future sought to focus on the key concerns of the many, not just the narrow interests of the few. It was at India's initiative that the African Union was admitted as a permanent member of the G20. And through that, we gave them a long overdue voice at such an important institution. Last year was a landmark year for India and Japan. As we marked the 70th anniversary of the establishment of our diplomatic ties, we are celebrating 2023 as the India-Japan Tourism Exchange Year with the theme connecting the Himalayas with Mount Fuji. The purpose of these celebrations is to facilitate greater engagement between our peoples, which would further solidify the foundation uh, of our ties. Today's dialogue is a very good example of a platform that brings together very diverse points of view to enhance and deepen our relationship. I wish all the participants and the organizers a very successful event and I am confident that the deliberations will bring out concrete ways to take forward the India-Japan Special Strategic and Global Partnership. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Minister Jayashankar, uh, for expressing uh, your uh, strong conviction on Japan-India strategic partnership, uh, especially in the context of free and open in the Pacific. Now, uh, let me uh, uh, turn uh, to our own uh, panel discussions. Here, uh, I'd like to begin uh, introducing uh, the participant first uh, uh, from uh, Japanese side, possibly, and then I would ask him on to introduce an Indian participant. Uh, on my left, uh, the uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Shinto Yasuharu. Um, he is a senior regional coordinator, Southwest Asian uh, Division of uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, on farther left, uh, Dr. Kikuchi Tsutomo, Emeritus Professor, Aoyama Gakuin University, Senior Adjunct Fellow, JIIA. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Ken. I'd like to just introduce to our speakers and panelists from Delhi Policy Group. Uh, first of all, we have Ambassador Nalin Suri. Distinguished Fellow for Diplomacy at the Delhi Policy Group. We also have Brigadier Arun Segal, who is our Senior Fellow for Strategic Stability and Strategic Balance. 
Um, and we have Commodore Lalit Kapoor, who is our senior fellow for maritime security. Thank you. Well, thank you. Now, I'd like to uh, ask uh, each participant to uh, deliver uh, their remarks uh, in, in, in not necessarily long, I hope. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, first of all, uh, uh, let me uh, ask uh, Ambassador Sully uh, to speak. Thank you, Ambassador Sully. Uh, we have had an intensive day of discussions yesterday in our sixth dialogue with the Japan Institute of International Affairs on the Indo-Pacific. The dialogue is a recognition in our two countries of the criticality of the Indo-Pacific region for the future of peace, security, and development in Asia, and for the further consolidation of the ongoing secular shift in the balance of economic and military power from the Atlantic to Asia and the Indo-Pacific. Ours are the two most important democracies in the Indo-Pacific, and our values and interest-based collaboration provides a very valuable underpinning for ensuring that the Indo-Pacific is a region that is open, transparent, inclusive, follows the rules of international law, respects sovereignty, territorial integrity of all, opposes the threat or use of force or coercion, and ensures mutual and equal security for all. A region where the focus is on the development of all countries. The war in Ukraine and the most recent horrendous Hamas attack of 8th October were a black song event, and the subsequent Israel Hamas war are together having the effect of upending the entire international order, the UN system, and the institutions of international governance, which were already under severe strain on account of underperformance and or the inability of to fulfill the mandates given to them on account of <clears throat> decision making structures and systems that had long, long ago become outmoded and not consistent with contemporary reality. In effect, we are now in a veritable no man's land <clears throat> on critical issues of international governance. Our dialogue yesterday underlined the importance of India and Japan collaborating to address this challenge and to work towards seeking solutions through dialogue and diplomacy. The Indo-Pacific region is confronted by a major hegemonic power that seeks to overturn the existing largely peaceful order in the region. The intention clearly is to seek dominance by reordering the existing balance of power in the region. There are various strands in the position of the G7 and Japan to face this challenge. These strands are not, in my opinion, always consistent, but are intended to manage the growing competition from China by keeping open lines of communication, focusing on strict reciprocity in economic, trade, and technological matters, and being prepared to meet the military and security challenge posed by that country in the Indo-Pacific region. We in India are at the forefront of con confronting this military threat and are simultaneously looking to establish secure and resilient supply chains necessary for continuing our rapid economic growth. This is another area in which the India-Japan partnership gains salience, including, for example, by strengthening the Quad, by strengthening bilateral trade investment technology transfers, and the defense partnership to give greater content to our overall strategic partnership. In the above context, the planned Japan-ASEAN summit later this year to mark 50 years of that partnership and the proposed vision for the new era in relations between Japan and ASEAN assumes specific special importance. Japan has successfully chaired the G7 and India the G20. In this process, we have not only rediscovered the importance of our bilateral relations in the context of the current very complex and dangerous state of international relations, but also that by working together, we can have a positive impact well in excess of our individual capacities. Both our countries recognize the importance not only of multilateralism, but also of multipolarity. The need of the art is to have multilateral and plurilateral institutions that are representative, just, efficient, equitable, and non-discriminatory. Such institutions must be adaptive and represent the reality of the contemporary world as it evolves. And these must be equitable develop and these and there must be equitable development of all countries, especially of the global south. 
The potential for bilateral interaction between India and Japan, be it in trade, investment, technology transfer, student exchanges, migration for employment, defense ex exchanges, etc., are well below desired levels and the opportunities available, though the momentum is building and the message from our political leadership, which we just heard, is to build the momentum further. PM Kishida has described India as an indispensable partner for Japan in the Indo-Pacific. Prime Minister Modi attaches high importance to it. It must therefore be ensured that this sentiment becomes reality. Thank you. Well, Ambassador uh, Sully, thank you very much uh, for covering a wide range of issues, including the Middle East, and also uh, Japan's role in G7 and India's role in uh, G20, and uh, and also in the context of leadership uh, in uh, Global South, and all these uh, collaborations, and also uh, quad and bilateral collaboration, Japan's role to ASEAN and so forth. That was great. Thank you very much uh, for uh, you know, focusing on the major issues we need to address jointly. Now, uh, I'd like to uh, ask uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Shinto uh, uh, to speak. He's participating uh, as a government official, but here he is participating uh, not necessarily purely as government official. <laughs> <laughs> so please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to participate in this uh, sixth uh, Indo-Pacific Forum today. Also, I'd like to thank the Delhi Policy Group and the Japan Institute of International Affairs uh, for organizing this event. It is no exaggeration to say uh, that currently the inter international situation undergoing drastic changes and that uh, uh, we are standing at a historic uh, crossroads. In the middle of the circumstances, uh, Japan and India have been working closely together and leading the international community's discussions. We are uh, like-minded countries uh, with shared fundamental values and strategic interests, and we are holding presidencies uh, of the uh, G7 and G20 this year, respectively. Next year, India will chair the Quad uh, Leaders Meeting, and Japan will chair the Quad Foreign Ministers Meeting. The challenges um, which, uh, international which the international community is facing, such as Russia's aggression against Ukraine, the situation over Israel uh, and Palestine, and attempts to unilaterally change the status quo in Asia are mounting, and the responsibilities of Japan and in India are greater than ever before. With these points in mind, in this session, I'd like to outline how Japan and India can exert uh, influence and contribute to the shaping the future of the Indo-Pacific region. First, let me introduce Japan's effort uh, based on free and open in the Pacific in short point. Our vision uh, for forcing the future of the Indo-Pacific region and Japan's contribution through the Indo-Pacific Ocean Initiative, IPOI, an initiative of India. The Indo-Pacific region uh, faces various threats uh, such as piracy, terrorism, proliferation of WMD, uh, weapons of mass destruction, um, natural disasters, and changes to the status quo. Under these circumstances, Japan aims to promote peace, stability, and prosperity in the region by making the Indo-Pacific a free and open as an international pu uh, public good through upholding the rule of law, ensuring freedom of navigation, peaceful settlement of dispute, 
promoting free trade and enhancing connectivity. During uh, his visit to uh, India in March, Prime Minister Kishida announced a new plan to expand FOIP cooperation. This new FOIP plan places multi-layered connectivity at its core, as countries must be connected in various aspects to achieve vibrant growth in the region as a whole. In addition, the new plan identified South Asia, including India, as a priority region for such connectivity. The new plan sets out a goal of mobilizing more than uh, $75 billion uh, in public and private funds uh, for the Indo-Pacific region by 2030 uh, in the area of uh, infrastructure, where there are substantial needs in each country. The government of India launched uh, an IPOI in November uh, 2019 uh, with the aim of protecting and uh, sustainably utilizing the oceans and making meaningful effort to achieve a safe and stable maritime domain. As a key player in the connectivity pillar under the IPOI, um, the Japanese government has been deeply engaged in this initiative as we organize six seminars on the connectivity uh, to highlight the importance of the connectivity across the Indo-Pacific. The development of Northeast India, the nexus between the Indian subcontinent and ASEAN, that is South Asia and Southeast Asia and beyond, will lead to the development of the entire Indo-Pacific region. From this perspective, Japan has been providing assistance, mainly in the area of infrastructure development. To date, our nation has provided more than 200 billion rupees, which is about uh, 315 billion yen, in assistance to this region. Which it comes to the development of Northeast India, it is important to view the project not only as a standalone entity, but also from the perspective of the development of the Bay of Bengal region as a whole. That is, to strengthen connectivity in both hard and soft aspect, from infrastructure to trade facilitation and uh, human exchange, including the Bangladesh. The new FOIP plan also calls for originally linking the development of Northeast uh, India and the initiative uh, of the Bay of Bengal Industrial Growth Belt, which is called Big B in Bangladesh, uh, to create an industrial value chain uh, for the entire region. In this broad region, spanning uh, Northeast India and Bangladesh can, gross, uh, can grow uh, in a unified fashion. The future of Indian Ocean uh, as a whole uh, will change dramatically. As I mentioned earlier, this year is a critical year for Japan and India as uh, G7 and G20 respectively. Next. I would uh, uh, now like to introduce how our two nations with such positions and responsibilities in the international community have worked together uh, to shape the future of Indo-Pacific region. About the G7, as the chair of the country of the G7, uh, Japan has positioned uh, the Indo-Pacific as one of the main agenda item uh, of the G7 uh, and has been leading the discussions within the G7. As a result, at the G7 Hiroshima summit, 
the, the seven reaffirmed the importance of a free and open in the Pacific and publicly laid out our vision on that. The G7 Hiroshima summit also reaffirmed the G7 members enhanced engagement in the in Indo-Pacific region. Their unwavering uh, support for uh, ASEAN's uh, centrality and unity and their commitment uh, to promoting cooperation uh, in line, the uh, ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, AOIP, on the Indo-Pacific, as well as their partnership with the Pacific Island countries. Furthermore, the G7 members agreed to welcome and to encourage further efforts uh, by the private sector, uh, private sector universities and think tanks uh, to contribute to the realization uh, of a FOIP. This is exactly what the uh, Indo-Pacific Forum is all about. In order to realize a FOIP, the involvement of value sharing partners is also important. And Japan will continue to strengthen cooperation uh, with the G7 and other allies and like-minded countries uh, towards the realization of a FOIP about G20. Japan has, a, uh, has positioned strengthening its engagement uh, with the Global South as one of the pillars of the G7 Hiroshima Summit. We invited India, the uh, G20 presidency, uh, and the leader uh, of the Global South uh, to the G7 Hiroshima Summit and have worked closely with India uh, to pass on the outcomes of the G7 uh, Hiroshima summit uh, to the G20 New Delhi summit. At the G20, uh, G20 summit, frank discussions were held on issues such as food security and health under the chairmanship of India. And we were able to reflect the outcomes uh, of the G7 Hiroshima summit on the G20 New Delhi leaders declaration. Countries uh, referred to uh, as the Global South, including uh, those uh, in the Indo-Pacific region, are facing challenges such as food. This is why Japan had sought to work with India to contribute to tackling these issues uh, in a way uh, that uh, uh, involves uh, concrete action. One of the outcomes uh, of the G7 Hiroshima summit was that we issued the Hiroshima action statement for resilient global food security with the leaders uh, of the invited countries, including India, and to express concrete actions there. I believe it was very meaningful that Japan and India, both located in the Indo-Pacific region, were able to work together uh, to lead the discussion uh, toward resolving these issues. In addition, I believe that uh, G20 New Delhi leaders declaration was also significant as all the G20 members uh, concurred uh, on the point of adherence uh, to the principles uh, of the uh, UN Charter uh, including territorial integrity and sovereignty. Japan and India will soon complete uh, their roles as chairing the presidency uh, of the G7 and G20. And Japan intends to further strengthen cooperation with India uh, in these international fora uh, and contribute to carve out the uh, bright future of the Indo-Pacific. As a prerequisite uh, for Japan and India to tackle challenges uh, in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, it is uh, essential that uh, both countries share a common awareness and work closely together 
on a regular basis. Last but not least, I'd like to talk about our efforts uh, to further strengthen the bilateral relations and the contribution uh, we can make to the future of the Indo-Pacific through these efforts. In recent years, the backbone of uh, Japan-India relations has been the multi-layered and uh, frequent high-level contact uh, between our two countries. In order to further strengthen the Japan-India special strategic and global partnership, uh, dialogue has been ongoing on the political front uh, with three summit meetings and three foreign ministers meetings held uh, this year alone. In addition, the second uh, Japan-India uh, 2 plus 2 uh, foreign and uh, uh, defense ministerial meeting was held last year. Through these opportunities, uh, both countries have confirmed uh, that they will cooperate uh, towards the common goal of realizing a hope. On the economic front, the Japanese uh, public and private sectors are working together to achieve the target of 5 trillion yen of public and private investment and financing from uh, financing from Japan to India in the five years. In addition to these efforts, uh, during his visit to Japan in July, uh, Minister of Economy, Trade and Industry, uh, Mr. Nishimura, uh, announced the initiative uh, for J uh, Japan-India industrial co-creation. One of the pillars uh, of the initiative, uh, expansion uh, into new market in countries surrounding India and Africa uh, through Japan-India uh, industrial co uh, collaboration is to strengthen India's manufacturing and export uh, competitiveness under the Japan-India industrial competitiveness partnership. Uh, and to support Japan exporters, uh, Japanese exporters uh, to expand into India, uh, which will contribute uh, to strengthening the supply chain in the Indo-Pacific region by strengthening India's export com competitiveness uh, through these efforts. It is expected that new supply chain uh, will be established, uh, which will lead uh, to the economic prosperity of the Indo-Pacific region, a pillar of FOIP. In addition uh, to the area uh, areas mentioned above, uh, these are needs uh, for cooperation in various other areas, such as security, uh, including defense industrial cooperation, uh, economic security, including semiconductors, uh, infrastructure, including high-speed rail, uh, science and technology, including space, uh, environment and uh, energy, and so on. Uh, we believe that uh, progress in each of these areas will uh, strengthen Japan-India relations and contribute to the stability and prosperity of the Indo-Pacific region. Next year, India will host the Quad Leaders Meeting and Japan will host the Quad Foreign Ministers Meeting. We hope that our two countries will continue to cooperate and play a leading role in promoting peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific region. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Sindo, especially addressing and covering all these important pillars of uh, Japan-India uh, partnership. One is quad, uh, you know, India is uh, going to host a leaders meeting, Japan is hosting a foreign ministers meeting. But also, the, there was a reference to this connectivity between the Japanese effort uh, and the FOIP. And uh, the Prime Minister expressed a new uh, new FOIP visions uh, in India. And that is also connected to uh, India's IPOI. And it's, uh, it's rolling over. And there has been extensive impact if that will be pursued and realized more gigantic way. And that is impacting not only India and Japan, but also the entire region in the South uh, bridging over. Now, um, I'd like to uh, thank you very much. I'd like to uh, uh, invite uh, uh, the Brigadier Chagall.
please. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I'll be very short, and I have just a couple of points to make, particularly in focus to how to influence India-Japan uh, in shaping an Indo-Pacific. Uh, my first point is that the perspective, when we're looking at the perspective of Asia, there are two separate perspectives. One is the continental and there's the maritime. The continental Asia is reasonably dominated by China, particularly the East Asia. It is in the South and the Central Asia, it is expanding its influence. But the maritime domain along the Rimland, it is, where, it is the area where China is attempting to increase its influence. And that's the, what the PL Navy's expansion is all about. This area of a Chinese attempt to enhance its influence corresponds to what we call as Indo-Pacific. And in this, the Japan and India are the two bookends. So Japan is a Western bookend and India is an Eastern bookend. And the space between the two, unfortunately, is China is attempting to dominate, particularly the South China Sea. And it is trying to make his moves into the Indian Ocean region and try to enhance his influence over there. The other element which we need to take cognizance of as we try to build up partnerships in the region is the fact is that the American attention as brought out by other earlier speakers is being diverted to other wars. The continuing war in Ukraine, the, the buildup that is taking place in, in, in the Palestine, uh, Israel war, which has, which is all indicators of of growing into a larger conflict if it is not managed at this particular juncture. This enjoins upon both India and Japan to look at the balance of power in more critical terms in the in in Asia. This is an important perspective. With the United States attention distracted, this provides a window of opportunity for the bellicose China to assert its influence. And this is where India and China needs to collaborate, India and Japan needs to collaborate more effectively. And this collaboration cannot be standalone by India and Japan alone. It requires integration of the major regional powers in Asia. Some of them we discussed like Indonesia, Vietnam, and other players, Philippines, who are integral to maintaining the stability and openness of the maritime connectivity and the sea lines of communication. It is here that we need to create an architecture. I'm afraid, despite our trying to attempting to build up relationship in bilateral terms, but in terms of security architecture, and even in terms of trade architectures, we are not doing adequately enough. Like I mentioned in my remarks yesterday, Southeast Asia is incrementally coming under the influence of the Chinese assertions, both in terms of economic power as well as this military power. That is not a good development. We need to do something about it. So the architecture which I have in mind is that it, we must address the security needs. India be required to do, deepen economic engagement with ASEAN. And we also need to create a more manageable and credible supply chain management and technological cooperation, particularly in critical technologies, sharing of intelligence, sharing of uh, maritime domain awareness. Here are some of the criticalities we need to address. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Brigadier Sagal, uh, especially uh, focusing on these issues of our I don't say diverted, uh, but uh, you, was, you said the, the kind of destruction of the American uh, attentions and so forth and yes. in the context of possibly Middle East and, and also uh, what, uh, <clears throat> Ukraine and so forth. I, uh, I see what you're talking about, all this importance of Japan-India cooperation. I don't say to fill the vacuum, but... Uh, they are still there. They continue to exert a big influence in terms of their unpleasance. But I agree with, with, with the importance of uh, both uh, countries could work together uh, to to sustain, I would say, regional uh, balance power and peace and security. 
Now, uh, uh, thank you very much. I'd like to uh, uh, move on to uh, uh, Dr. Kikuchi. Uh, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ambassador Sasai, and good morning. I'm uh, I'm quite happy to be here at the six uh, <clears throat> in the Pacific uh, uh, Forum. So already, you know, previous uh, speaker pointed out you know, Japan and India uh, jointly engaged in constructing and maintaining so-called free and open a uh, rule-based uh, regional order in, in the in Asia Pacific. This is an enormous task. We have never seen the, for la the last uh, several decades. So how we should address this enormous you know, task? So no, usually a stable regional order require two conditions. One is the stable balance of powers. And second, uh, legitimacy. Then legitimacy means uh, support by a wide range of stakeholders, uh, regional countries and institutions to the regional orders, free and open in the Pacific uh, regional orders in our case. For stable uh, balance of powers, we need to do a lot, you know, the such as our own effort to enhance our own defense capabilities, also constructing our uh, security network with uh, like-minded countries. But uh, I think the most important one is to keep U.S. engaged in the, the regions. So without U.S. continued engagement uh, in the Indo-Pacific regions, probably a balance of power would not be sustained in these regions. So Japan has been doing a lot to keep uh, U.S. engaged in not only the defense of Japan, but also uh, security of the Indo-Pacific for the last uh, uh, several uh, decades, uh, several years. So India is now recognized the importance of U.S. presence in, in the Indo-Pacific. So U United States is no longer security challenger to uh, India, now it's but the provider of security public goods to India. And also the, the uh, to gain the regional uh, legitimacy, uh, we need to provide a public good that is uh, beneficial for the regional stakeholders, countries and institutions. The maritime security or connectivity, digital economy, uh, uh, blue uh, economy and so forth. Also, we need to help the countries in the regions uh, to enhance their national resilience so that they could uh, uh, stand up the to coercion or intimidation by some the some uh, countries in the regions. So resilient states is uh, still essential uh, foundation, essential foundation for free and open in the Pacific. The, our enormous task, uh, probably we require new institution to complement the existing institution and frameworks. And in, in that you know, context, you know, the, as already previous speaker pointed out, quad quadrilateral security dialogue could play a quite important role in terms of maintaining of balance of powers and also uh, gaining regional legitimacy for free and open in the Pacific uh, regional orders. Thank you very much. I, I will stop here. Uh, thank you, uh, Kikuchi Sensei. Uh, you again, uh, likewise, uh, stress on the importance of maintaining regional balance of power, and especially U.S. Uh, commitment and uh, engagement in the region. 
and um, it, it is also uh, good to, to note that uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, uh, security collaborations uh, underway between the United States and India. Yeah. That is, uh, we have uh, allied relations with the United States. Uh, India is not necessarily allied to the United States in traditional sense, but it's becoming more of the security partner. That is great uh, to note. Okay, then um, I would uh, ask uh, Comrade uh, Kapoor, please. Thank you, sir. The influence and promise of India. Thank you, sir. The influence and promise of India and Japan in shaping the security future of the Indo Pacific is going to be primarily in the maritime domain. So my focus is India-Japan Maritime Security Cooperation, where if I remind everybody of Dr. Jayashankar's words earlier today, we need to work to ensure safety, security, and stability. And all three require a different set of actions. Nine years ago, we upgraded our bilateral partnership to the special strategic and global level for this purpose. And defense and security cooperation was a key pillar. We have seen considerable movement ahead. The question is, is it enough? The Indo-Pacific environment has become far more unstable with one country seeking to impose its revisionist will on the region. In the East China Sea, unilateral assertion by this one country is endangering the livelihood and lives of your people. Mass incursions by aircraft and maritime vessels in Taiwan's waters have become a daily affair. A former commander of the US Pacific Command has gone on record to say that the South China Sea is under China's control in all circumstances, short of a war with the US. And pressure on the Philippines in the second Thomas Shoal is increasing by the day, threatening regional cohesion. In the Indian Ocean, the PLA Navy presence has increased substantially. As we speak, the 44th Escort Flotilla is operating in the Straits of Hormuz, while the 45th is off the Straits of Babel Mandib the two vital choke points for energy and trade flows and east-west links for both our countries. An adversarial aircraft carrier task group will deploy in the Indian Ocean before the end of this decade, adding to the coercive power available to this one country in the Indian Ocean. So what should we do? We must prioritize two immediate actions to ensure that bilateral defense and security cooperation has an impact. First, the scope of maritime security cooperation must be expanded from the non-traditional security threats that formed the underlying foundation of our 2009 action plan. We have enhanced our dialogues and we have enhanced the content of our exercises. These changes must be formalized through a new action plan. In parallel, we need to expand intelligence cooperation and domain awareness to include gray hulls and the ability to track submarines while enhancing our joint presence in the, Indo in the Indian Ocean. The other priority area is strengthening India's maritime capability through defense equipment and technology cooperation as envisaged in the 2014 Tokyo Declaration. Whether this is by transfer of high quality modern equipment or through joint development of new technology, we have very little to show in this direction. The solution to my mind lies in manufacturing equipment jointly in India, not just for India's much larger market, but also for export to countries of the global south, 
thus undercutting a significant tool of China's growing influence. It is this cooperation that holds the largest potential to transform our partnership into one which will truly impact the region and make it a truly special and strategic global one. It is slow progress in these two areas that jeopardizes our vision for our free and open Indo-Pacific. So if we are serious about FOIP, this is what I think we need to do. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Comrade Kapul. Uh, you know, uh, uh, this uh, discussions on Japan-India defense and security collaboration, we had uh, a very deep discussion yesterday, and um, there was uh, great interest expressed, uh, to some extent even concern, on the pace of uh, this uh, uh, collaboration, especially in the context of defense technology and assets, uh, you know, uh, collaboration. You were mentioned about uh, this uh, joint uh, man potential joint uh, manufacturing, you know, uh, uh, cases. And uh, but uh, I think we are at the same time uh, uh, trying to open up a new horizon for the arms export uh, readiness to, to to be more seriously engaged in regional uh, security architecture. So. Uh, I take note of uh, your reference uh, to the importance of uh, uh, the, this non-traditional to more traditional security collaboration and also intelligence and multi, uh, maritime domain awareness. These are very important issues. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that the uh, two countries will continue to address all these important questions. Now, um, the, uh, the since the uh, speaker uh, the address uh, uh, their own agenda or perspective. Now, I'd like to make the floor open. Mm -hmm. There are uh, a couple of uh, questions uh, already are uh, given to us. This is an anonymous uh, question uh, from the audience. Uh, so uh, uh, the first question is, uh, what is the role of India and Japan in the Quad? What and how can they deliver through the cat? These issues were more or less addressed uh, by the audience, I think, uh, in the, the remarks. But uh, is there anything uh, for, for the participant to add in this context? Uh, you know, uh, uh, and uh, the what the, the Quad can do more. I mean, is there any opinion, possibly more in the context of uh, security and defense? Because over uh, this issue, there was some sensitive part. Uh, and, but still, I think it, although this is open for, uh, uh, we could address this question if, if you have uh, any further thoughts on this one. Perhaps, Hemant, you yeah. want to say anything? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I will just very briefly comment that uh, that Quad is a factor of providing regional public goods and regional reassurance to nations, giving them options and uh, affirming to them that the rule of international law and the purposes and principles of the international of the UN Charter will be applied uniformly across the region uh, in and we want a region which is free from coercion where all countries big and small can prosper. So the quad has a very wholesome uh, overall uh, impact on the region. Respect for the Quad, acceptability of the Quad is increasing uh, in Southeast Asia, which is the most important part of the region connecting India to Japan through the through the maritime. We also have some security linked uh, uh, initiatives coming up in the Quad. We all know that in the in the realm of non traditional security, the Quad has principles for HADR interventions and uh, for strengthening. Uh, immediate response uh, together. We also know that the, the Quad is advancing the IPMDA, which is the Indo-Pacific Maritime Domain Awareness uh, Initiative. It's coming through from, from the Western, uh, uh, from, the, from the Pacific side towards Southeast Asia, 
And the intention, of course, is to also include and cover the islands of the Indian Ocean so that there is greater uh, realization of the security benefits uh, which are provided by the Quad. So overall, I think um, at this juncture, um, uh, there is need to, to further implement the decisions taken at the last Quad Summit to increase our complementarity with and support for regional institutions which already exist, which is ASEAN, IORA, and PIF. So I'll stop there. Uh, I think uh, we are doing a lot, but on maritime security and uh, uh, other issues, I think the colleagues can can further add to this. Want to add anything? Okay. I think uh, the the basic issue is that, uh, like like the ambassador said, we need to strengthen cooperation in IOR and AORA, as also uh, in the regional uh, domain. Uh, see, uh, the, the, the main important issue is, is that we also have to upgrade and faster, make faster development technologies and supply chain initiatives are slow to take off. So we need to focus on these initiatives, particularly to uh, uh, Southeast Asian countries to uh, who are becoming a dominant export destination for China. So if we are if we are talking about de-risking supply chains, there is an important necessity for us uh, to have a greater degree of engagement, as mentioned by Ambassador, with uh, Southeast Asia, and also to maintain balance we need to do more exercises and in this regard india has started uh, as you are aware that we did a major maritime exercise with the asean we have we have uh, there is a major exercise with philippines recently so mm -hmm. india has started to move its footprints into the south china sea so it's important that this similar kind of complementarity is done by the other quad partners in terms of moving their footprints both into the Southeast Asia, South China Sea, and into the Indian Ocean region, in particular Bay of Bengal. So this is an area that we need to focus upon. So there need to be a greater visibility of Quad uh, in this uh, in this region in terms of flying the flag, so to say, as a matter of reassurance to the regional partners. Well, thank you. That's great to note that uh, India is a growing and actual interest in being engaged in the peace and security is a southern part of uh, Asia yeah. beyond the Indian Ocean. And that is something uh, we need to uh, we need to be mindful. Now I'd like to take take in this moment uh, to shed the light on the India's the strategic relationship uh, with the United States, because I think obviously uh, there is some uh, uh, defense collaboration underway. Uh, there were two plus two meetings and so forth. So uh, could the Indian uh, uh, participant uh, introduce uh, what's happening on your relationship with the United States uh, uh, to the Japanese audience today? Let me just say a couple of things and then my colleagues can can supplement. Uh, we just had the India uh, India United States two plus two meeting uh, 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 in in the previous week uh, in Delhi. Um, the across the board strengthening of a strategically oriented comprehensive partnership between India and the United States is going on and accelerating. Um, uh, security is an important element of that uh, cooperation, uh, and so is defense, uh, and so is diplomatic coordination and consultation. So uh, across the areas which cover the geopolitics of the Indo-Pacific, or rather in, uh, the globe, uh, to the regional security issues, to the strengthening of our defense ties, uh, defense exercises, uh, every area is being progressed. What is at the heart of this? So in, in, in short, the heart of this uh, uh, progress through the 
2 plus 2 is the mutual reinforcement through the strengthening of India's defense capabilities, uh, ind indigenous Indian defense manufacturing, so that India can not only uh, better uh, provide reassurance and deterrence uh, for itself, but also have the same impact across the region and all the countries uh, of the region of the Indian Ocean and spreading in from the Indian Ocean into Southeast Asia can benefit from that. Um, that progress has been quite remarkable over the past year. And the second element is um, a uh, government-led initiative uh, on uh, critical and emerging technologies. And these encompass not the, just the civilian areas of development of critical technologies, but also the defense areas of uh, um, uh, technologies. And this initiative is actually government led by the two NSAs of, the, of India and the United States. And it has very senior high level uh, private sector participation in it. And uh, through this, we've seen uh, major results already. We've seen massive investments on both sides uh, happening in emerging technology areas uh, from India to the United States and from the United States to India, uh, including semiconductors. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think this, is, this progress is going to continue because it's a program which is regularly led and monitored at a very high level within the government on both sides. So I have uh, I must I must say that we are looking uh, better and better in terms of uh, working to uh, ensure that India and the United States have a mutually re reinforcing impact mm -hmm. on all issues related to the well-being of the Indo-Pacific. Mm -hmm. Any any other points which my colleagues want to make? Yes, we you know some some very important steps have been taken. Like, for example, we are sharing technologies on G414 engines. This is a very important critical step. For uh, In addition to that, we are also looking at to developing supply chains for major armament systems. Striker uh, is one which is now being, disc is being discussed. We're looking at M29Bs, uh, not only purchase of M29B, but uh, replenishment, refurbishment, and starting uh, a supply chain component development etc in india the that's uh, so there there is a huge effort to develop uh, uh, an indo centric supply defense supply chain which is not india centric alone or india's capability enhancement but will also support similar systems in the region so, so that's that's an important part. So it's not going to be just to say that it's India is going to benefit. It's going to be a regional benefit situation where where that the systems which are being developed and all all jointly being produced would help everybody in the region. Then the next element is the MRO uh, repair organizations. They and the American ships have started coming into our ports and and our shipyards for uh, refurbishment. Then there is this whole big initiative of sharing in information intelligence and uh, uh, and, and credible intelligence, so that uh, the domain awareness, regional awareness, etc., becomes that much more uh, 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 possible. Uh, the initiatives with the Americans are. I just want to highlight this fact: do not cover only the maritime domain; they also cover the continental domain. And the continental domain our initiatives basically are in terms of uh, uh, providing our situational awareness, ISR as they call it. That initiatives are very strong, and that that's uh, so. In short, uh, the our joint collaboration with the United States in terms of technology transfer, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, are a part and parcel of credibly enhancing India's capabilities to be an um, important regional player in the Indian Ocean region and to deal with the Chinese assertions in this place as also tomorrow as, as capacities enhance and our other program, our submarine and other programs go on board, we will be able to uh, uh, play a much broader regional role. So that's the, that's the whole issue. 
Okay, before asking Ambassador Sully to speak, uh, uh, let me uh, make a bit of comment on what you said, uh, Sagal-san. Uh, uh, what's happening between India and the United States on this defense collaboration, including uh, asset transfer and the joint uh, technology uh, development collaboration? I'm talking about defense and military. Not, uh, uh, of course, uh, there are some aspect of uh, uh, private business mm -hmm. engineering, of course, but uh, I'm basically addressing this uh, military and defense uh, technology things. Uh, uh, you know that uh, Japan is now uh, seriously addressing these issues of uh, and restrictions on the arms export, and that would, of course, include. Uh, some uh, sensitive technology and so forth. And, uh, but uh, you think that the United States is uh, proceeding ahead of, of Japan in the context of this bilateral defense collaboration. Uh, so what do you expect uh, Japan uh, to do more in the context of strengthening this strategic relationship uh, with India? Thank you. I just wanted to comment on the broader implication of the two plus two dialogue between India and the United States. I think it reflects a long-term stability in the strategic partnership. It's taken us a while to get here. Uh, and to put it in context, uh, we need, we can draw lessons from where we've reached with the United States in developing the relationship with Japan in a much faster time frame. I think it's taken us time to explain to the Americans how important it is to transfer technology and to build in India. We are not going to compete with them in other markets. We will be doing this together. I think this, this signaling of the 2 plus 2, and please bear in mind that the last 2.2 happened in the midst of the problems of the Ukraine war and the Israel-Hamas war. Nothing is disrupting this process. And the, 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 the impact of the last set of agreements, including as uh, Bridia Seigel talked about the transfer of technology for the G414 engines, I think is a very quantum leap in the, in the trust that has now begun to permeate through the India-US Defense and Security Partnership. I think that is the important signaling. Uh, and it seems to me that this now transcends the bipartisan divides on other issues in the United States both the conservatives and the Republicans and the Democrats are on board on this issue. And uh, obviously it takes uh, a serious threat to bring, uh, bring such matters to this kind of collaboration levels. But I think this is no longer a short-term partnership. At least we don't see it that way. We see this as a long-term partnership. We've come a long way in the relationship with the United States. It's never been a very clear or easy run. Uh, it's not an easy run, frankly, even now, but I think there is understanding on both sides that, you know, the obstacles will keep happening. There will be political disturbances based on domestic considerations, but the long-term trend is stability and a very strong partnership going forward. And this is not simply because of the threat of one particular country. I think this is part of the process of a recognition in the United States that the balance of power is shifting from the Atlantic to the Pacific or to the Indo-Pacific. And they need to look for new partners which have common values and interests. We can always dis dis disagree on which values and which interests are more important at a particular point in time. But I think the underlying agreement is now a solid one. And I think that is the importance of this disagreement. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, you know, Ambassador Suri, especially the, your last point. Uh, the growing importance of uh, India in the context of uh, maintaining balance of power. So in that sense, uh, traditionally, you were uh, sort of, uh, I don't say on a camp in terms of maintaining a free and open democratic uh, institution in this part of the region, mm -hmm. while you are maintaining your own independent policy, uh, multipolar uh, policy. Remains. Yeah, that <laughs> remains. I mean, that's the important part because I don't want to mislead the Japanese audience <laughs> that uh, you are becoming more on our own camp per se, but you are still open uh, 
uh, to to the other you know uh, legs and hands uh, around you. Indeed, I think yeah. that is important uh, part of uh, proper understanding uh, on the part of the Japanese uh, public. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I think uh, time is running. A anybody uh, to say something before concluding a decision? <laughs> You want to say anything? You come from the government, so say something. <laughs> <laughs> say a few words, whatever you want to say. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, um, I'm in a position uh, to uh, oversee the uh, you know entire uh, South Asian region, and the uh, uh, like mentioned in the uh, you know uh, question. Uh, Quad is an important part mm -hmm. of the, uh, you know, uh, collaboration uh, between uh, Japan and uh, India, mm -hmm. and the, uh, um, you know, uh, already uh, previous uh, panelists are mentioned uh, frequently that mm -hmm. the uh, we have a number of the uh, collaboration uh, instance like the uh, two plus two and the uh, you know joint staff meeting of the uh, you know uh, self defense force and the uh, you know in the military, uh, so uh, you know new development is going on in uh, every sector and the you know multi layered. So uh, um, so uh, the uh, uh, in a different sector. Um, uh, relationship between the uh, India and uh, you know Japan is becoming more important. Thank you, uh, Kikuchi Sensei. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. If after after Kikuchi Sensei. Yeah, please. as for the regional security role of Japan and India, we, you know, I I would introduce quite decent, inter quite interesting, you know, development in Southeast Asia. So not only Japan, but also, you know, not only Japan and India, but also, you know, together with uh, other like-minded minded country like the US, uh, Australia, and Canada, and some other, you know, uh, countries, they are, you know, on the individual basis, deeply eng engaged in uh, providing the security assistance to the frontline states like uh, Vietnam and Philippines. So, you know, now we are, we are seeing March day you know, defense uh, supporting activities by, you know, the like-minded country to those, you know, to frontline states, uh, you know, the over South China Sea and so forth. And so this is, uh, you know, I'm not sure this is coordinated or not, but anyway, this is a quite interesting uh, uh, development we are, we are seeing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and thank you, Kikuchi Sensei. Uh, I guess that this, this invisible hand of God are uh, guiding past. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Heman, I, you just, have to... I just wanted to complete the uh, answer to uh, the question which you had raised about India and Japan, and I won't be long. I'll just say that uh, uh, in the context of what we just heard, uh, my colleagues mentioned, Ambassador Suri mentioned about the long-term perspective of continued development of India-United States relations. And your question was related to what India and Japan uh, can do. Uh, I think uh, we need to be laser sharp in our focus. There has to be greater presence of our maritime forces. Uh, um, that should include uh, not just each other's reason, regions on one side, but also Japanese presence in the Indian Ocean. Uh, the second uh, is uh, higher levels of interoperability in exercises. Uh, the more we develop this on the bi bilateral front, like we have uh, with the United States, the better it will be for us. Uh, and uh, the th third is uh, not, not just maritime domain awareness in general, but also under underwater domain awareness and the technologies which go along with underwater domain awareness. And the last area of synergy I think we need to step up on is uh, de defense equipment and technology sharing. And I think we're trying our best to make a breakthrough. Hopefully it'll happen sooner rather than later. Thank you. Well, uh, Himan, thank you very much. Uh, uh, that would possibly uh, conclude uh, uh, this session. Uh, uh, I want to thank your uh, 
all the participants, uh, including uh, the audience uh, participating online. Um, now, um, uh, let us uh, conclude and uh, uh, sign the uh, joint statement of the thought. Just. I hope the uh, audience uh, could read. <laughs> that would be online, uh, JIIA and DPG online, right? Yeah, yes. the uh, homepage. Okay, here you go. Oh. If you both look up for a second, perhaps you can take a better picture. Okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's shake hands like this. All right. Oh, it's good. Okay. All right. Good, good, good. So uh, this would uh, end the uh, of this open sessions. And uh, once again, I want to thank all the participants. Uh, there was a good discussion taking place. I wish you you have a good day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ken. I, let me uh, also add a word of thanks to the Japan Institute uh, for Industrial Affairs and uh, you personally for hosting us uh, in in Tokyo. We very much look forward to welcoming you to India next year, mm -hmm. and uh, we also. Uh, are grateful for the support of the Ministry of External Affairs uh, on the Indian side and Gaimusho on the Japanese side for the continuation of this premier forum for strategic communication between us. And I do think that we've made a contribution last day and a half uh, to the ideas which may propel faster progress in our relations. And uh, I think we should continue to work together even more closely as the years go. Thank you very much. Well, thank you.